All righty. That link was just posted a second ago, so I'm going to give folks a minute to trickle in. Today, we are going to, I, I want to recap a little bit what we uh, talked about in that video lecture, just to kind of give people a chance to ask questions. We can take a few problems from the homework. Um, and then we are going to move on. We're going to move out of section 2.6 into the next bit of material, which gets us pretty close to talking about the derivative. <clears throat> So we're going to hold just for a second while folks arrive. OK, and let me flip over to the document camera so we can begin doing the thing. There we are. Oh. So this is MAC. Two three one one section zero zero four. I forget your section number. Yeah, zero zero four, which is Calc one. And the date today is the nineteenth of January, twenty twenty two. And uh, for the most part, I have my voice back, and we're starting to feel a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit human again here. The file sticker household, which is good. Um, I know that over the last week we lost a number of office hours and we lost a class meeting and the video lecture and not that's that's shitty so I'm, I am sorry that happened to you guys um, but uh, through the rest of the term here it should be smooth sailing today I want to do a few things I want to recap a bit of section 2.6 which was on limits at infinity, um, because that video lecture, again, is nice, but it's, you know, it's not the same as being able to ask questions. And then we're going to talk about <clears throat> section 2.7, uh, which is on rates of change. And gets us, gets us close to talking about derivatives, which are themselves rates of change. <clears throat> So the first thing I'd like to do, and um, if it requires a little bit of participation from you guys, if you could type into the chat any of the homework problems from section 2.6, um, that is any of the homework problems from this uh, second homework set, uh, especially towards the end there that you would like to see. We talked about 2.2 and 2.3 together as a class, that's uh, limit laws and continuity. Um, but thinking specifically of questions from, where did 2.6 start? <clears throat> questions from 17 on. I see number 33 there. Let's see if there's anything else you guys would, would like to discuss. I'll give you just a few minutes to take a look and let me know. And while you do that, I am going to grab a bit more coffee. Ooh, that is strong. Right. So again, we're just typing into chat any problem numbers that we would like to see from homework two, specifically anything after question number 17. Uh, which is where, where the problems from 2.6 showed up. <clears throat> so far we have 30, 33, and 34. Very one. While you guys are doing that, I'm going to um, remind you the main tricks for limits as x goes to either plus or minus infinity of some function. <clears throat> 
if f of x is a, a ratio, something like um, p of x over q of x, then to take the limit as x goes to either plus or minus infinity of f of x, uh, we divide top and bottom by the fastest growing term. Uh, this is a trick that I call the renormalization tool or renormalization trick. <clears throat> because if you divide by the fastest growing term, then you'll be left with constant terms and terms that go to zero. Um, <clears throat> kind of implicit in a part of that is this theorem that the limit as x goes to either plus or minus infinity of one over x to any positive power p is equal to zero. And that's because as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, any positive power of x will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you take one and divide it by a very, very large thing, you get a very, very small thing. So in the limit, we say that's one over infinity, which is zero. These are the main two tricks. We also had a few big results on a few special functions. Um, <clears throat> The limit as x goes to negative infinity of e to the x is zero. And the same is true for any um, growing exponential. As you run off to the left, those all approach the horizontal asymptote zero. if b is bigger than one, right? That's a, any growing exponential. Um, <clears throat> another kind of special function is the inverse tangent function. As x goes to negative infinity, or the inside of the inverse tangent function goes to negative infinity, he approaches negative pi over two. And as x approaches positive infinity, the inverse tangent of x approaches positive pi over 2. These special functions, these, this information comes from the graph, right? Um, the graph, this is from graphs. But we should know. So the graph of e to the x or any positive, uh, a growing exponential. They all have graphs that you know from pre-calculus look like this. And then <clears throat> the graph of the inverse tangent function looks Like that main branch of the tangent function from negative pi over two to pi over two kind of rotated on its side. The vertical asymptotes for the tangent function become horizontal asymptotes for the inverse tangent. And horizontal asymptotes and limits at infinity are the same thing. So arctan or the inverse tangent function looks like this. <clears throat> And of course, this graph shape here for e to the x is the same for any other exponential that is growing, any other b to the x where b is bigger than 1. So these are the, the main tricks or main results from section 2.6.
there were some other things there and hopefully everybody watched that video um, but I, I don't mind recapping these. These are the things that we will use over and over and over again. Any questions about these statements? Um, can you use that first one in an example, like the uh, P of X over Q of X? Sure. Let me see if any of the problems that you guys picked uses that. If not, I'll cook one up real quick. So 30, 31, 34. 33, 30, 31 is going to be one of those. <clears throat> so we're looking for vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So let me go through these in order. I'll do 30 first, and then we'll talk about 31, uh, which Marcos is where uh, we will use one of those, one of those tricks. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to come back here if anybody's still writing. We'll hold for about five more seconds. If you need it, take a screenshot. This should all be in our notes already, but just, just reminding. <clears throat> okay, turn on the page in five. Here we go. So of those requested problems, the first one was number 30, where we're trying to take the limit as x goes to infinity. This is homework two, number 30. We want to calculate limit as x goes to positive infinity of e to the negative 6x times the cosine of x. <clears throat> and your first thought here might be to just take the limit of each piece on its own. Right? According to our limit laws from section 2.3, that's allowed as long as both limits exist. So our first thought. is to just say, okay, the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 6x times the cosine of x should be the limit, limit of, limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 6x times <clears throat> the limit as x goes to infinity of cos x. Let's start with the e to the negative 6x limit. As x goes to positive infinity, what does e to the negative 6x do? Uh, zero, right? Very good. e to the negative 6x is a decaying exponential, right? <clears throat> Again, this is, these are graphs that we ought to know pretty well, or you could think of it as a horizontally reflected version of e to the 6x. In either case, this is going to look like e raised to the negative infinity. And you can do that. You can just write this as, okay, well, as x goes to infinity, negative 6 times infinity, if you take a giant positive number and you multiply by negative 6, you're going to get a negative giant number. So that's e to the negative infinity. And over here, the cosine, if you just plug in infinity for x, you get cosine of infinity. e to the negative infinity is 0, right? That's, that's OK. Cosine of infinity? What does the cosine function do as its inside gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Again, a lot of this comes from knowing the graphs, right? And I, I do trust everybody here made it through trigonometry. I think everybody knows what the graph of cosine looks like. It's just a wave, yeah? And if we look at that guy, as x gets larger and larger and larger, oh, Am I getting closer and closer and closer and closer to any one particular value as I go further and further to the right? Nah, this son bitch just bounces back and forth from one to negative one all day long. He never settles down towards anything. These y values never approach any particular number as x goes 
further and further to the right. No matter how far you zoom out, no matter how far to the right you go, he just keeps doing that same shit over and over again. So this guy is the problem. This does not exist. <clears throat> And then the question is, oh, OK, if this one does not exist, uh, this limit does not exist, then technically this split was not legal, right? If you look back at the limit laws from 2.3, it says you can split limits up like this if both of those limits exist. But this limit does not exist. So splitting up like this is no bueno. So what do we do? my early 2000s internet humor stale yet? Um, <clears throat> probably, right? In other words, that first idea is not going to work. It's not going to work. But if you think about this function, cosine just wobbles back and forth from negative 1 to 1. e to the negative 6x decays rapidly to 0, right? We can. We can look at the graph of e to the negative 6x on its own at this scale. It's a little wild looking. But here, the blue is e to the negative 6x, and he is zooming down to 0. So what do you think would happen if you multiplied those two? Let's not spoil it in Desmos. The idea here is that you have what we would refer to as a bounded function, a function that never blows up to infinity or negative infinity. It always stays finite in range, multiplied by a function that is going very quickly to 0. That is the hint to use the squeeze theorem. cos x is bounded, and this guy decays to 0. Oh, that looks like decays to too much, um, decays to 0. <clears throat> so anytime you have a bounded function multiplied by a function that goes to 0, it's a good hint to use the squeeze theorem. This suggests squeeze theorem. And that's the path that's going to get us get us where we need to be. So the second idea, a better idea. Is to use the squeeze theorem. <clears throat> How do you use the squeeze theorem? Well, what, what does the squeeze theorem say? Anybody remember that? Uh, the limit in the middle goes to the limits that are defined by the other. Good. Yeah, that's the idea. So the squeeze theorem is all about inequalities. Right? If my function is trapped between two other functions and those two other functions go to the same place, then my function must also go to that place. So the squeeze theorem, this means we should build an inequality. With my function, e to the negative 6x times cos x, in the middle. And the trick to building that inequality is the boundedness of the cosine function. What's going to allow us to construct this inequality is the fact that the range of cosine is finite. <clears throat> So 
specifically, I'm going to start with the fact that cosine is never smaller than negative one and is never larger than positive one, right? We looked at that cosine wave just a second ago. No matter where you look, this thing is always smaller than positive one, bigger than negative one, never steps outside that window. This implies multiplying through the inequality everywhere by e to the negative 6x this. So to pass from this inequality, which is true by virtue of the bounded nature of cosine, to this inequality, which is going to be the one we use the squeeze theorem on, we just multiply everywhere by e to the negative 6x. You can do that. <clears throat> you can multiply through an inequality by any positive term. Since e to the negative 6x is always positive, again, look at the graph. Blue graph never goes below the x-axis, right? Always positive. You're allowed to multiply through your inequality by that. Now, this is where we're actually going to apply the squeeze theorem itself. The squeeze theorem says if the function on the left and the function on the right both go to the same place, then the function in the middle goes to that place as well. So we look at the limit as x goes to infinity of the function on the left, negative e to the negative 6x. We've already said that e to the negative 6x goes to 0, right? This is negative e to the negative infinity. And e to the negative infinity is 0. So this is negative 0, which is 0. And the limit as x goes to infinity of the function on the right which is just e to the negative 6x. That's simple. That's just e to the negative infinity, which is 0. So by the squeeze theorem, and the inequality, and since there are two inequalities on the page, I'm going to give this guy a name. I'll call the one that we're using here star by the inequality star. It follows that the limit of the middle function as x goes to infinity must also be 0. <clears throat> Okay, and that is your standard squeeze theorem problem. And I can show you in Desmos what all three of these graphs look like. First, are there any questions on the, on the mechanics or the syntax here? Kind of what we did, how we did it, or how we described it. In the video lecture, I called this function g1 and this function g2 and the middle function f, right? If f is bounded below by g1, bounded above by g2, and the limit as x approaches a of g1 and g2 are both equal to the same value, l, in this case, 0, then the limit of the guy in the middle must also be equal to l. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that he's, this guy is squeezed between these guys. And the squeezing is actually very clean. Let me show you. So I'll leave e to the negative 6x. Here's that guy. 
Let me fiddle with my axes a little bit. Y axis, let's say one. X axis, let's go. Uh -huh. uh, let's do fifty. Uh, we'll zoom in a little more. Here. So here's e to the negative six x. Here's negative e to the negative six x. And then the function that we're actually squeezing is the red function. And it's, it's hard to see in here, but the red function eh, is always trapped between the green and the blue. And since the green and the blue both go to 0, the red is stuck going to 0 as well. Now, off to the left, this red function does all sorts of crazy shit. We're not worried about that. We're looking at what happens as x goes to positive infinity. I'm going to make this. Try to make this a little more visible. It's tough. But our red function is a rapidly decaying oscillating function. <clears throat> Pretty neat, right? Over here, let me just a little addendum. Curves like e to the negative ax times cos of bx or e to the negative ax sine bx. These actually have special names, are called. damped harmonic oscillators. <clears throat> um, you know, when you walk out of a gas station, the door has this, or you look at the doors on, on campus, they all have these uh, little arms on the top that have a gas cylinder connected to them. So you can't slam the door. It might makes it close soft. The old fashioned ones make a little noise. They go like, as you try and, as you try and shut the door. And it bites you a little bit. That's a, called a dash pot. Um, and what it does is it's like a gas piston shock, just like the shocks on your car. It smooths out the motion. <clears throat> that is a dampening effect. And this exponential, this decaying exponential e to the negative ax is a dampening effect. So if you were to take a dash pot like that and put it on a swinging pendulum, Imagine a very long, very heavy pendulum swinging back and forth. But then I put one of those gas shocks on it. That gas shock is going to make it swing a little bit less each time. And it will dampen the natural harmonic oscillation, the natural swinging back and forth of the pendulum. Uh, you encounter these in nature quite a bit. If you look straight on from the side, imagine you've got a, a satellite going around a planet. And that satellite is, it doesn't have enough energy. So it starts to spiral in towards the planet um, and eventually will crash into the planet. If you look at that straight on from the side, that will look like a damped harmonic oscillator. It'll go back and forth, but it'll come in more and more and more until it crashes. These things are very, very important in physics. And in Calc 2, I'm going to teach you how to, um, how to do some cool calculus operations with these. Uh, curves, sorry, curves like these. An easier to see example is something like something like this. Uh, that's too much. Uh, let's let's relax that dampening factor just a little bit. Uh, yeah, this is maybe a bit better. Right, so you see this starts off. Yeah, that's good. Right, we start my y axis is silly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, starts off oscillating reasonably, but then these oscillations decay very quickly. And that boundary curve 
is the e to the negative 0.1x. So this is what's going on. Same thing in, in our problem, just the, the dampening factor there was much larger. It was six instead of 0.1. So it goes to zero very, very fast. Well, that's it. These are cool things and their graphs are, are neat and they're important in physics and we could talk about them all day. So I'm gonna shut up. Well, that's, that's the idea. Okay. <clears throat> Next one we wanted to look at was number 31, which is our opportunity to employ that renormalization trick. In addition to the limits at infinity here, in addition to wanting um, horizontal asymptotes, they're asking for vertical asymptotes as well. So let me just write down the function. And we've got 7x squared plus x minus 3 divided by x squared plus x minus 42. All right. um, <clears throat> two kind of things here. We're looking for all the asymptotes. So I want vertical asymptotes, which are places where the function blows up to infinity or negative infinity. And I want horizontal asymptotes, which come from taking limits as x goes to positive infinity and negative infinity. Let's look for the vertical asymptotes first. We know from last Friday, Vertical asymptotes are x values, right? Vertical lines, x equals a constant, where this function blows up to infinity or negative infinity. To find these for a rational function, which is what this is, right? A ratio of polynomials, the top and it's a big fraction ratio, and the top and bottom are both polynomials. So for a rational function, these can be found. by looking for x values where two things happen. The bottom should go to zero and the top should not be zero. Right, because if you take a normal sized number and you divide it by something very close to zero, you're going to get an enormous number out. That's that, you know, one over zero is infinity thing that we talked about before. So as long as the bottom is going to zero and the top is not going to zero, then you'll have a normal sized number divided by a very, very small number. And when you do that, when you divide like seven by 0 0.0001, you get something enormous like 70,000 or, you know, in the limit, it'd say infinity. The trick is to factor the top and the bottom. <clears throat> I don't think the top factors here. But the bottom, I'm looking for two numbers whose product is negative 42 and whose sum is positive one, that's seven and negative six. Um, we can check the top also. There I'd be looking for two numbers whose product is, let's see, negative three times seven is negative 21, um, <clears throat> and whose sum is positive one. So are there any, no, 21 semi-prime, it's just three times seven. So the top doesn't factor, right? Not, not over the integer, certainly not gonna have a shared factor of x plus seven or a shared factor of x minus six. So where does the bottom go to zero? Well, whenever this factor or this factor are zero. So as x goes to negative seven, or as x goes to positive six, right? If you plug in negative seven, this factor is zero. If you plug in positive six, this factor is zero. 
<clears throat> and you do want to verify that the top is not zero at either of those places. But if it were, then there would be a factor of x minus six or a factor of x plus seven. And that's, that's not possible because 21 is semi-prime because the top doesn't factor nicely. Another way to check if the top factors is to use the discriminant, right? B squared minus four AC, that works for a quadratic. So B here is one, A here is seven, C here is negative three. So one squared minus four times seven times negative three is uh, one plus 28 times three, which is 96, 97. So the discriminant there would be 97. So there are roots here, but since 97 is not a perfect square, uh, they're not integers, they're irrational numbers. So however you wanna do it, we arrive at the fact that this top is not zero at six or negative seven, but the bottom is zero at those values. So those are your vertical asymptotes. Um, I abbreviate vertical asymptotes as VA. And this trick works for the majority of functions. When you're looking for vertical asymptotes, you look for where the bottom is zero. If it's a trig function like tangent, you write tangent as sine over cosine and look for places where cosine is zero. If it's some ratio of exponentials like e to the x over six minus e to the x, you set that bottom six minus e to the x equals zero. This is your general rule for vertical asymptotes. All right, any questions on the first part here? Just real quick, so you said, they aren't vertical asymptotes if they make the top zero as well? If both the top and the bottom are zero, then you need to investigate more carefully. It's a good question. So what happens if both the top and bottom are zero? Well, that means that there's a factor that you should be able to cancel between the top and the bottom. So if, there was an, if the top factor does x plus seven times something else, then I could cancel the x plus seven which would mean there's a hole there. Remember that discussion back in 2.2? Then the only vertical asymptote would come from x minus six. It is possible that you had like x plus seven and then downstairs x plus seven times x plus seven. Then when you cancel one of the x plus sevens with the top, there's still one left over downstairs and then you would have a vertical asymptote. So if both the top and bottom are zero, we'll make a note. <clears throat> If the top equals zero and the bottom equals zero at x equals some value a, factor both, cancel whatever you can, and then start over. It's a good question. We should address it. So if the top and bottom are both zero at any particular x value, that means there's a shared factor between the top and the bottom. And you can cancel that shared factor and start over. Maybe they'll cancel perfectly, and both of those factors will go away. Maybe they'll cancel imperfectly, and there will be an extra copy of one of those factors left on the top or bottom. If there's an extra factor left on the bottom after you cancel everything, then when you start over again, you'll find that the bottom is zero there, but the top is no longer zero there because you've canceled away that factor and you'll discover a VA. Okay. <clears throat> Horizontal asymptotes. These are found by calculating limits as x goes to both plus and minus infinity of your function. And some functions have different horizontal asymptotes on different sides. So you really do need to do the two limits separately. 
Now, I, I can tell you another little time-saving trick. If your function is a rational function, again, ratio of two polynomials, only works at the top and bottom are both polynomials, then the limit at positive infinity will be the same as the limit at negative infinity. You can really get away with just one. But in general, you should look at both separately. So that, that's what I'll do here. So here, the limit as x goes to positive infinity of my function is the limit as x goes to positive infinity of 7x squared plus x minus 3 divided by x squared plus x minus 42. And for these limits, limits as x goes to infinity, uh, you don't want the factored version, you want the expanded version. And this is where that renormalization trick comes in handy. You could also, if you remember how to do polynomial long division from pre-calculus, you could do that also, right? You can long divide the top by the bottom and then take that limit again. That, that will give you an expression that's easier to manage. Um, but I like the renormalization trick. <clears throat> So what we're going to do here is renormalize by dividing top and bottom by the fastest growing term. What is the fastest growing term anywhere in this expression? We've got an x squared, an x, and constants. 7x squared? Yeah. <clears throat> and 7x squared and x squared grow at about the same speed. So I would, I would only worry about the power functions themselves. Don't worry about the coefficients. You could divide top and bottom by 7x squared. It would still work. It's just more, more arithmetic. So let's do it. And again, be good with your notation, right? So always write the limit. Don't skip writing the limit. That is uh, a bad habit to get into. And when things are equal, connect them with equal signs. At this stage, I'm gonna be kind of verbose and say, okay, I'm gonna divide this by x squared, i.e. multiply by one over x squared in the top. <clears throat> and in the bottom. And now, of course, I need to distribute this, right? This distributes to everything. Same downstairs distributes to everything. And when we carry out that multiplication, 7x squared times 1 over x squared is 7. x times 1 over x squared is 1 over x minus 3 times 1 over x squared is just 3 times 1 over x squared. I'd leave it like that. So that's my numerator. My denominator, x squared times 1 over x squared is 1. x times 1 over x squared is 1 over x. And negative 42 times 1 over x squared is minus 42 times 1 over x squared. And this is where the theorem from page 1 comes in handy. According to our limit laws, I can take the limit of each one of these pieces individually. So as x goes to infinity, what does 7 do? Don't overthink it, not a trick. Yeah, this just stays seven, right? Seven doesn't care what x is, it's just seven. What about one over x? As x goes to infinity, what does one over x do? It doesn't exist. Uh, so careful, so we're sending x to infinity here. So this is like one over infinity, which is zero. So the theorem that we're re relying on at this stage <clears throat> is that the limit 
as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to the p is 0 for any positive power p. Lighting conditions keep changing. So this is like 1 over x to the 1. So he will go to 0 by the theorem. This is 1 over x to the 2. He will go to 0 by the theorem. 1 over x to the 2 goes to 0. 1 over x goes to 0. So if we want to write this out with maximal clarity, we're taking the limit at this stage, so we don't need to write the limit anymore. The top is 7 plus 0 minus 3 times 0. And the bottom is 1 plus 0 minus 42 times 0. And on a good day, that's 7. That's 7 over 1, which is 7. I have a question. Yeah. Do you want to? Can we also use the if it's the rational polynomial? We can get the horizontal asymptote if the powers are the same by using seven over one. Or do you want to see the work? I um depends on how the problem is phrased. So if the problem just okay. says give me the asymptotes, then I'm fine with you saying ah oh, quadratic top quadratic bottom seven over one. Okay. That. That rule from pre-calculus, which I'm glad that you remember, comes from this trick. This trick is how you prove that rule. Now, if I say, instead of just asking for the asymptotes, if I say, calculate this limit for me, then I would like to see that you know these steps. Um, but yeah, if the problem just says, find the asymptote, and you do this, um, that's great. If it says, find the asymptote, and you apply the pre-calculus rule, I'll accept that. If it says, you know, calculate this limit, show all your steps, then I need to see these, these steps. Okay, thank you. Or the long division, right? If you choose to long divide the top by the bottom and then take the limit of that, that would be okay also. All right. Um, now remember that this theorem actually has a plus or minus here. So if we replaced all of these infinities by negative infinities, everything would stay the same. So I'll just say here that the procedure for when x to negative infinity f of x is identical. In other words, i.e. the limit as x goes to negative infinity of this function is also seven. So we could finish this up. And we're just observing. And therefore, what is this one is therefore the horizontal asymptote is the line y equals seven, and that's it. One now again, if it's not a ratio of polynomials that you're looking at, if you've got trig functions or exponentials or anything else going on here, um, then you really do need to separately calculate the limit as x goes to negative infinity. Any questions on this one? How did you get uh, x squared? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So when you're factoring out uh, 1 over x squared, uh, why did you choose x squared? So, um, <clears throat> The trick for taking limits of rational functions as x goes to infinity or to negative infinity, the kind of standard trick, is to divide top and bottom by the fastest growing term. So what I do is I look through the, each of the power function terms here, or each of the individual terms in this expression, and I ask which one grows the fastest. Uh, and if you're talking about power functions, that's going to be the largest power of x. 
So x squared is the largest power of x that shows up anywhere in this expression. So I divide top and bottom by that. That is the fastest growing term. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Jay, your audio cut out a little bit there. One more time. Oh, that's all. I'll just, just it has to be like a jump disc. I think maybe it's something going on in the background. I heard someone say something about a jump discontinuity, but I couldn't quite make out what you were saying. Mm. Okay, cool. We got it in the chat. All right. <clears throat> if there was like an e to the x, right? If this was 7x squared plus x minus 3e to the x, then e to the x would be the fastest growing term. And that's what I would divide out by. Moving along, that's 30, 31. We wanted to see 33, I think, also, right? So this is another squeeze theorem problem. Uh, here, they're giving us the inequality. <clears throat> and they're saying, if this inequality is true, can we find the limit as x goes to infinity? I'll paraphrase here, assuming that 8e to the x minus 21 over e to the x is less than f of x is less than 4 root x over the square root of x minus 1, all under the square root, find when x to infinity f of x. And they qualify the inequality by saying this is true for all x greater than 1. Um, <clears throat> as long as this were true for all x greater than some any particular finite value, that would be good enough. So what we need to do is look at the limit of this guy and look at the limit of this guy. And if those two outer functions have the same limit, then the inner function must also have that same limit. Right, by the squeeze theorem. The limit as x goes to infinity of both outer functions are the same. And that value must be the limit we're looking for, a limit x goes to infinity of f of x, right? Because f is assumed to be trapped between these two functions, if they both go to the same place, then f is going there as well. <laughs> if those limits were different from one another, then we're boned. We don't learn anything. But hopefully, if the problem's structured well, those limits will be the same. Uh, the limit of the first guy is actually quite easy. I can think of several ways to do this. Um, how about you guys tell me? What, what could we do here? Divide the numerator and the denominator by the fastest growing variable. Yeah, the renormalization trick will do the job. What is the fastest growing term here? E to the x. Yep. Oh, did I write this down right? Hang on, I have a suspicion. Yeah, <laughs> this would be a two down here. Or we'd be in real trouble. All right. All right, so make that, make that correction for me. Sorry, when I wrote the problem down, I missed this two. There's a two here, which means there's a two here. Yeah, we can renormalize. So for the squeeze theorem, um, it can be uh, greater than or equal to, it, it, it is, I, have, I have my notes here saying f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, which is greater than or equal to h of x. That's true. But, 
These inequalities could be strong or weak. Either one is okay. Okay. Kind of the, <clears throat> the idea behind the squeeze theorem, um, and if you remember the theorem that came right before it, is that limits cannot break inequalities. They can turn strong inequalities into weak inequalities. Um, meaning if you take a limit through an inequality, the worst thing that can happen is that these would turn from less thans into less than or equal twos. But yeah, the squeeze theorem can operate with a less than or with a less than or equal to. It works fine with either. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and proceed. Let's divide top and bottom by e to the x. My numerator here, I've got eight e to the x minus 21. So I'm going to divide by e to the x, which is multiplying by one over e to the x. And downstairs, I have two e to the x, and I'll do the same thing. I'll multiply by one over e to the x. <clears throat> when I do this, upstairs I need to distribute because there's two terms there separated by addition or subtraction. So distributing 8e to the x times 1 over e to the x is 8. And then I have minus 21. I'll write that as e to the negative x. <clears throat> right? 1 over e to the x is e to the negative x. And then downstairs, 2e to the x times 1 over e to the x is just 2. So the only kind of funny business here, the e to the x and this 1 over e to the x cancel to give you the 8. 21 times 1 over e to the x is, you could write it as 21 times 1 over e to the x, but I, I prefer to write it like this because 1 over e to the x is the same as e to the negative x. And this is a piece that we've discussed how to take the limit of. It just looks cleaner that way. But either one is fine. Now, as I send x to infinity, as x goes to positive infinity, the constant 8 stays the constant 8. e to the negative x, this piece, is going to go to zero. That was one of our special functions from the first page. So the numerator is 8 minus 21 times 0. And the denominator, 2, again, constant 2 stays 2. So this is 8 over 2, which is 4. <clears throat> And you said you got the 21 e to the negative x how again? Sorry, I was. That's all right. So when I distribute this, that's going to be 8 e to the x times 1 over e to the x minus 21 times 1 over e to the x. The e to the x is in the first piece there, cancel, and I get 8. And then this other piece is 21 times 1 over e to the x. And 1 over e to the x is, is literally e to the negative x. It's just another way of writing the same thing. You could leave this piece right here as 1 over e to the x if you like, like how that looks more. I just prefer not to see fractions within my fractions wherever I can avoid it. <clears throat> gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. OK, the other piece requires a little bit more love, um, but we'll get there just fine. Don't, don't worry. I'm going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of 4 root x divided by root x minus 1 like this. And the thing that makes this a little wonky is that the whole denominator is under the square root. <clears throat> if it was root x and then root x with the minus 1 outside the root, that would be a little easier. because then my fastest growing term would just be root x. It'd be easy to identify. Um, but what is, so what is the fastest growing term here? The root x squared. Interesting thought. <clears throat> Walk me through your logic. Because uh, if you shove the square under the square root, it's just x. Like if, if you just divide them both by x squared, 
under the square root, it turns into an x. That is true. And I think the way you're thinking there is necessary on some other problems, but not on this one. So <clears throat> a little note, it's not useful for this problem, but I like that you brought it up. Sometimes it is useful to think of x as the square root of x squared. Uh, this is true as long as x is positive. <clears throat> so if you're trying to take a limit as x goes to plus infinity, and you have both x's floating around, and you have some shit under square roots floating around, it can be useful to divide top and bottom by x by dividing top and bottom by the square root of x squared. That will allow you to combine the square root pieces together. In this case, we don't actually need that. <clears throat> Here's how I would think of it. The fastest growing term in the top is definitely root x. That's the only term in the top. Downstairs, I've got the square root of x minus 1, which is the same thing as the square root of x, just shifted to the right by one unit. In particular, this guy grows at the same speed as this guy. So when you have some terms under a square root, especially if you have multiple terms separated by addition or subtraction under the square root, and you're trying to figure out its contribution to that fastest growing term discussion, what you should do is look for the fastest growing term under the square root and then take its square root and pretend like the whole thing grows at that speed. In other words, while you cannot give the square root to the x and the 1 separately, the rate of change for this function is approximately the same as if you could. So the top and bottom here are both growing at about the speed of root x. I can show you in Desmos what I mean. Reset these to something sane. All right, look at these two curves square root of x, square root of x minus one. And look at how they're growing. <clears throat> they're very, very similar, right? They're pretty close to one another. Neither one is pulling ahead. Neither one is much bigger than the other. The word for this is asymptotic, right? Their asymptotics are the same. Now, that's where the word asymptote comes from, by the way. Asymptotic just means studying these things for very, very large values of x. And as you scroll way to the right, these graphs actually get closer and closer to each other. They are asymptotically equivalent. In fact, one is just a horizontal shift of the other by a single unit to the right. <clears throat> so the fastest growing term here is really the same from the top as it is from the bottom. They both grow at the speed root x. So when I renormalize here, I will divide top and bottom by root x. And then downstairs, there will be a bit of algebra to do. All right, here's what we're looking at. <clears throat> oh, pro tip, tails on the end of your square root tell people where they stop. That's always nice. Upstairs, the cancellation is clean, All right? That's just four. Downstairs, <clears throat> the square root of x minus 1 stays as the square root of x minus 1. 1 over the square root of x is the same as the square root of 1 over x. And I want you to think about why that's true.
if I gave you the square root of one over x to start with, and I asked you to simplify it, you could take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. The square root of one is just one. And I'm really working from here to here when I go from here to here. <coughs> so this is a rule for square roots and for powers in general, right? If you have a, a power of a ratio, that is the same as the ratio of the powers. You can't split square roots up over subtraction or addition. You can split them up over multiplication and division. Now I can rewrite the bottom. as one big square root, <clears throat> right? The square root of A times the square root of B is the same as the square root of, oh, I'm saying A and confusing my own brain, A times B. This is a one, right? So the square root of X minus one times the square root of one over X is the same as one big square root with X minus one times one over X inside. <clears throat> Distributing under the square root in the denominator. One over X times X is one minus one times one over X is one over X. Now you can take the limit of each piece. So the limit of four is four, shove the limit under the square root. The limit of one is one, the limit of one over X is zero. So we get four over the square root of one minus zero. One minus zero is one. So this is four over the square root of one. The square root of one is one, so that's four. And there are problems, <clears throat> uh, especially if you go hunting for extra practice in the textbook, there are problems where these sort of mechanics get a little bit more complicated, and it might be worthwhile to take a look at some of those if any of this feels at all strange. I'll hold here for a second, and I'll, I'll show you the problems I have in mind. Questions on this? Okay, uh, so in summary, before I jump to the textbook, the function <clears throat> on the left went to four, the function on the right went to four. By the squeeze theorem, if both of those limits are the same, then that value must also be the limit of the function in the middle. So we can wrap things up by saying, therefore, by the squeeze theorem, And the inequality the limit as x goes to infinity of this unknown function f of x is the same <clears throat> as the shared value of those outer functions limits Okay, some extra practice problems that I recommend for folks who want to look more closely 
at those um, tricky square root things. This is a good example. So if you want guided practice, example four here, this is very good. What they do is they say, okay, downstairs fastest growing term is X. Upstairs, the fastest growing term is X squared, but it's trapped under a square root. So his contribution to the speed of the top is really like the square root of X squared, which is just X. So they choose to divide top and bottom by X. <clears throat> Then the big step is going from here to here, where they use this fact that we mentioned a minute ago. You can treat this x downstairs as the square root of x squared, and then merge the two square roots. Then you take the limit of all those pieces. <clears throat> if you want some more opportunity to play with this stuff, kind of on your own, there are several good problems in the book. Uh, 14 is, is a, a pretty easy example of such a problem. <clears throat> and then more challenging examples like that would be numbers 22, 23, and 24. <clears throat> um, really 23 through 25, 25 also has that flavor. Problems like 27, 28, and 29, uh, you would want to do a multiply by the conjugate type thing and then apply those methods. So those would be um, also good, good examples where you can practice that. I think that's about all they have here. Oh well, no, 54. <clears throat> 54, your, your long-term goal is to graph this function, but first you're finding asymptotes and it's the same functions from the example. Yeah, that's about it. So hopefully you've gotten a good amount of practice with limits at infinity and negative infinity and starting to understand how to calculate those things um, in this more sophisticated way, right? The tricks from pre-calculus and college algebra for finding horizontal asymptotes of rational functions can save you some time, but many of the functions we're interested in are not rational functions. They'll involve square roots or exponentials, other stuff like that. So as we uh, work through this homework set, Try to contextualize what we're doing with what you did in pre-calculus. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about are rates of change. Focus. So I mentioned on the very first day that <clears throat> the long-term goal for the first part of this class is to understand the concept of a tangent line and an instantaneous rate of change. The difference between my average speed over a trip and how fast I'm going at any moment during that trip. We're gonna play with those ideas using limits. Um, and I want to follow the theorems in the textbook quite carefully. So the, the pictures are the same that we have used in the past. Some of their notation is crappy, but yeah, okay. So these pictures are a little hard to reproduce by hand. Um, we've seen this picture, right? The secant line. Here's this idea of a secant line turning into a tangent line by dragging the second point closer and closer and closer to the first point. What we want, <clears throat> long-term goal again, I give you a function f and a particular x value a, and I want you to find for me the tangent line, this red line, to the curve f of x at the x value a, at that point, a comma f of a. The way we get there is by coming up with a formula for the slope of the secant line. See, all I really need for this red line is the slope. Once you know a point on the line and the slope of the line, you can write down the equation of the line using the point slope form. <clears throat> so the main goal here I give you 
a function f and an x value a. We want to find the tangent line to f at x equals a. And I do think it's wise to try and reproduce something of this picture in your notes. <clears throat> so here's the graph, y equals f of x. I'll say a is like right here. This point then is the point a comma f of a. <clears throat> the tangent line, good purple pen. Remember, the tangent line here is the line that sort of just kisses this curve with just the right slope. So that, like, if you were skiing along the graph, that line is pointing the direction your skis would go. Right? So, this is the tangent line. The way that we do it is by thinking about some other point on the graph, and there will be multiple notations for this. Constructing the secant line or the slope of the secant line. and dragging this point closer and closer to this point. <clears throat> the point over here is x comma f of x. Again, remember the day one discussion? Any point on the graph of a function is the input there comma f of that input. Very important to remember that. <clears throat> Uh, I've said this, but what we need, two things. A point on the tangent line same two things you need to find any line and the slope of the tangent line. A point on the tangent line is not hard to come by. It's the point of tangency. It's the point on the graph that is shared by the tangent line and the graph, right? The tangent to this graph touches that graph at the point we call the point of tangency. So the point is the point a comma f of a. And we call this the point of tangency. The slope, that's the challenge. <clears throat> So I know this picture is a little cluttered and it is kind of challenging to draw good versions of these pictures by hand. So I'm gonna go back to the textbook here. The idea <clears throat> is you think about 
these blue lines, the secant lines, where one of the points is fixed, the point of tangency, we don't move that. But the other point, the point that's coming from the x value x rather than the x value a, that point I allow to move closer and closer and closer to the point of tangency. <clears throat> I bring this point closer and closer and closer. And in the limit, the slope of the blue lines becomes the slope of the pink line. I think I have a Desmos graph for this. Let me see. Slope of tangent, I don't think that's it. Can I not have secants becoming tangents? Is this just recent graphs and all safe graphs, really? Mm, disappointing. <clears throat> okay, secant line. Yeah. So if I drag this point closer, right? Right now, this is a secant line. Yeah. The red line is a secant line. <clears throat> As I drag this point closer and closer and closer to the base point, that secant line becomes a tangent line. That's the magic here. So what we do is we come up with a formula for the slope of this secant line in terms of the x value here. And then I take the limit as that x value approaches a. And that will give me the slope of my tangent line. <clears throat> what we do is we take the limit as x approaches a. Remember, here's x, here's a of the slope of the secant line. <clears throat> And this will give you the slope of the tangent line. And the usual notation for this <clears throat> is m tan. So what is the slope of the secant line? All right, uh, this, so this is our, our main thing, right? <clears throat> and then we use the point slope formula. Well, I'll remind you what that is when we need it. So coming back to this picture, what is the slope of the secant line? Well, it's the rise over the run. The rise here is the y value here minus the y value here. <clears throat> so the slope of the secant line is the rise over the run. which is <clears throat> f of x minus f of a, that's the rise, y value here minus the y value here, divided by x minus a. <clears throat> which means that the slope of the tangent line And the standard notation for this is m tan, right? m for slope, just like in mx plus b, and the subscript tan, meaning for the tangent line, must be the limit <clears throat> as x approaches a of the slope of the secant line. Well, the slope of the secant line is f of x minus f of a over x minus a.
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is probably the most important intellectual discovery humankind made in the last 500 years. No shit. <clears throat> I'll be opening this week's homework today. Yeah, right after class. Uh, there's a magical name for this thing. It's called the derivative. So if the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a exists, we call it <clears throat> f primed of a. <clears throat> this notation here, f prime, the apostrophe is called a prime. And it's uh, called a uh, referred to as the derivative of f at x equals a. It's possible for that limit to fail to exist. And we're going to talk about terminology and everything associated with that stuff in a minute. <clears throat> but if somebody asks you what's the limit definition of f prime of a, you would say it's this thing. I will give you another formula for this. It's it's the same shit. Um, but first, let's get a bit of practice. Okay. <clears throat> Let's find the equation of the tangent line. to the function f of x equals x squared at x equals 4. All right, so this is us trying to do the main thing. I gave you a function and a particular x value, and I want to come up with the equation of the tangent line to that curve at that x value. <clears throat> the picture here. Certainly we all know what x squared looks like. It's a parabola opening up, vertex at the origin, blah, blah, blah. Looks like this. If I tell you that right here is x equals four, then this point on the graph is four comma 16. And the tangent line looks like this. The equation of that purple line is what I want. And according to the work on the previous page, I need two things. <clears throat> Give me the point and the slope. The point is easy. The point is always the point of tangency, the point on the graph where the tangent line and the graph are meant to match up. That point is 4 comma f of 4. f of 4 is 16 because f of x is x squared. So this is 4 comma 16. The slope is f primed of four. Which by definition, and when you see a colon equal sign like this, that means <clears throat> by definition is equal to 
the limit as x approaches our x value here, which is four, of f of x minus f of four divided by x minus four. And this is why you saw so many limits that looked like that in the previous sections, because we need limits of this nature to calculate these tangent lines. <clears throat> My next step is just to plug in, what is f of x, what is f of four? Everything else comes along for the ride. Lim x to four, f of x is x squared, f of four is 16. And we should know at this point how to handle something like this. Can anybody suggest <clears throat> a nice way to calculate this limit? I'll let you go right after this. I know we've gone over a little bit here. Factor it out. Yeah, factor the top, right? If we try to plug in four, the top and bottom are both zero, that's no good. But if I factor the top as a difference of squares, this is x minus four times x plus four divided by the bottom is x minus four times one. <coughs> cancel, cancel. This is now the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4 over 1, which is just x plus 4. Uh, so that's 4 plus 4, or 8. So my slope is 8. And my point is 4 comma 16. Now, by the point-slope formula, Hopefully we all remember this. If you don't, <clears throat> this is how you write down the equation for a line just from knowing any point and the slope. You don't need to know the y-intercept. <clears throat> any point x naught comma y naught that's on your line, slope m, our tangent line, is y minus 16 equals 8 times x minus 4. And you can stop here, or you can try to put this into y equals mx plus b. I don't particularly care. That would be 8x minus 32 on the right when you add 16 to both sides. Negative 32 plus 16 is minus 16. Either one, this or this, fine by me. If I were you on a test, I would stop here so you can get on to the next question. All right, <clears throat> that's it. Today's a big day. We made it to tangent lines. We calculated our first derivative, and we used it to write down the equation of a tangent line. That is the big hurdle in the first chunk of this course. <clears throat> From here, we're gonna go on to do a lot more stuff. I'm gonna give you other ways to calculate these slopes. There's another kind of way of writing this limit that is a little bit nicer if you're trying to do more than one of them at once. I'm trying to get a formula out for the derivative instead of just f prime to four, like f prime to anything. Uh, it's a nice way to do that. Um, and then we're gonna learn how to take derivatives without doing all this limit nonsense. And you're gonna be like, why the fuck did you make me do all that limit nonsense? And I'll be like, well, cause you had to understand where it comes from. Um, your homework is going to begin with this sort of stuff. So calculating uh, limits of this nature to get slopes of tangent lines, constructing tangent lines using the point slope form of a line. If you don't remember this, take a screenshot, write it down, tattoo it on your skin, whatever it takes. Uh, do not forget this, right? This is the best way to write down any line because it doesn't require knowing the y-intercept, just any point on the slope. Um, that's it for me. I appreciate you guys for hanging around. Sorry for taking up a little bit extra of your time. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, tomorrow, I have another office hour from 11 to 12. And then on Friday, we're going to talk more about derivatives and uh, we'll look at some application problems where you can recognize these things as, as being quantities from the real world. 
Uh, anything you guys would like to ask or talk about before I end the meeting? All right, then again, I thank you for hanging out a little bit past the end of class time. Hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you on Friday. Oh, something in the chat. Okay, no, just thanks. Yeah, you have a nice day too. Take care, guys.